I'm a great editor and I bring people together and I'm really about kind of taking an idea, I think very visually a lot in terms of space and digital. I have that ability to really create a great team and pull it off. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Devers and this is Clever. Today I'm talking to Georgiana Stout. Georgiana, or Georgie as she is known, is a founding partner and executive creative director of 2x4, a global design consultancy in New York with a focus on brand strategy for cultural and commercial clients who value the power of design. Her clients include Target, Starbucks, Instagram, Nike, Tiffany & Co., Tom Ford, and Malin and & Getz. In the cultural sector, she's led brand identity and exhibition design for institutions such as the Cooper Hewitt, Brooklyn Museum, Dia Art Foundation, and the Studio Museum in Harlem. She's directed product development at 2x4 for Knoll, Maharam, and Tarquette. 2x4 has notably been long-term collaborators with both Prada and Rex, formerly OMA, and is highly regarded and quietly legendary in their field for being early pioneers of a holistic, multidisciplinary creative approach to working with brands. You'll hear Georgie also make mention of her husband, David Weeks, a lighting designer, current Rome Prize winner, and early guest of Clever on episode 12. She's thoughtful, kind, and a creative force of enormous magnitude. Here's Georgie. Hi, I'm Georgie Stout, and I live in Brooklyn, and I work in Manhattan, in the Soho area of New York. I have a design studio called Two by Four, and I am one of three partners. My partners are Michael Rock and Susan Sellers. And we run a creative studio that really merges brand with experience and kind of in all ways that brand can come to life. So it could be brand identity. It could be something much more experiential in terms of a retail space or a corporate space. And we do a lot of cultural work as well. So. We work in kind of all realms of design. And it's been a delight to research all the work that you've done. It's also been really interesting to me how you were able to carve this wide open space from a long time ago when that was relatively unheard of. So we'll get into that. But before we get there, I really want to know a bit about how Georgie got to be Georgie. So can you take us all the way back to your youth, your family dynamic, and the formative experiences that left an impression on you? Yeah, so I was born in in New York City. My parents met at college and ended up both being in New York and getting together here. And I was born in the city and my full name is Georgiana and my mom had wanted me to be Jana, which was one of her best friends but I was also named after my father's grandmother and just became Georgie, which was one of those names growing up that everybody was like, that's a boy's name or had opinions about. But, and I honestly haven't met that many Georgies in my life. So I, I appreciate it. And I like uh, having that kind of like space to have developed my personality within. So I grew up initially in New York. My parents traveled a lot for work. My father was a a programmer early on and, you know, he would get sent all over the place for different projects. And so the family would go with him. And so, um, you know, when I was young, I lived in Arizona. Clarifying question, a programmer early on, like what is the life of an early on programmer like? He studied math in college and started doing uh, like computer programming in the 60s. So it was really the kind of foundational languages that allow computers to just turn on and create. And what was interesting about him was he was a mathematician, but he was also an artist. Like he had really wanted to be an artist, but that wasn't really like a viable quote unquote career at those times. So he was kind of pushed into engineering by his family and then eventually into math. That's a path he took, but he had this very creative mind. So growing up, you know, he worked doing his programming during the day. And then at night he painted and also was an amazing photographer. And so like a lot of my childhood photography is, I have no like color snapshots of my life growing up, but I have these artful, beautiful (laughs) black and white (laughs) pictures of my sister and I. Um, (laughs) So like, it's, it's kind of amazing 
but also like a lot of times I miss like whole chunks of like, like I have no photographs of my home growing up because that wasn't like interesting to him as a subject matter. <laughs> right. N- no, like just standard blowing out the birthday candles. Totally. And- <laughs> none of that. And because, you know, cameras were kind of a novel thing at that point, you know, you either had your little automatic camera or my dad would have like a black and white that he would walk around with. So we were never, we never were a family that had like a little color photo camera around. No snapshots, just, just composed art photos. Yes, <laughs> totally. <laughs> wow. I always wonder like if somebody who didn't know you at all discovered your life through these photos, what do you think they would discern from that? It was very um, romanticized and very like, because we, I think the biggest part of that childhood story is that we ended up moving to Paris when I was about four Mm. until when I was about eight. And I had a younger sister, two years younger. So we went to France and lived in Paris for four years. And so that was like an amazing experience, both from like when I look back on it visually as documented by my dad, also because they, you know, every weekend we ended up going somewhere. So like there's pictures of us in Ireland and Greece and just all over and these really amazing black and white photos. So it's very romanticized, I would say. (laughs) Sounds like it. I mean, it also sounds legit romantic, like just from a reality perspective. Yeah. And I mean, I think they had a great philosophy about life, which was just like, pick up and go wherever. So we we traveled a lot. And it wasn't like fancy by any means. Like, it was very much like just driving in our like, Renault four like tin can car through the countryside and like finding a hotel to stay in. And it was very cool like that, you know, just very embracing the adventure of life in a kind of scrappy and resourceful way. Yeah. And my mom was always present and she didn't work at that time. So she just was with us and making our lives happen in a really fun way. That does sound like a very romantic childhood. One of the things that sounds amazing about it too is from four to eight, you get this picture of the world outside of your domestic landscape. And so any sort of ethnocentrism was probably completely dissolved. And your worldview is now shaped growing up from a much broader perspective. I think that's right. And I think also like they were very much like they would call themselves beatniks. I think when we lived in New York, like I've had people say like, oh, your parents are such hippies. And my mom would take very big issue with that. But they had like a very kind of open and and I think art was a really big part of the vision, right? So like I went to a Rudolf Steiner school in Paris where I learned no um practical. <laughs> like when I came back to the States, I couldn't read. I was like way behind in math, but I was like, I knew how to knit. I knew how to play recorder. <laughs> I could like do pottery. Like I was very crafty and could kind of create in all these different ways. And I think the way we learned math was through drawing, like, you know, on a clock, you would draw f- your times tables was like, start at 12 and go three, six, nine, like with mm. drawing and stuff like that. So I think my whole intro to those bigger concepts was through art in a way. It sounds like like the concept of embodied and visual learning was very much baked into it. Yeah. That's really interesting. So it sort of makes sense that graphic design is a avenue that you would choose to explore later on because it probably like it does all those things. Yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. sort of in my DNA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, so we have romanticized black and white image of your childhood, international, the daughter of beatniks, traveling around, seeing (laughs) all manner of interesting places in the world. Where did that go from into your teenage years? And how did you reconcile yourself with who you were becoming? Well, it was interesting to come back to the States because I think my parents, we didn't really know anything about America, weirdly. (laughs) It wasn't something you would talk about or think about, really. It was just, you're just living your life as a child, right? But you're learning mostly like European ways, history, mostly French, right? And then we came back to the States. My parents came ahead and my mom 
decided that she didn't want us to grow up in New York City, but like wanted to be somewhere where we could just have a kind of a more down to earth childhood and be in nature and whatever. And so my dad though, did need proximity to the city. So they kind of drew a circle around New York city and they looked in like Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut and Long Island. And we ended up moving to East Hampton of all places, which this was 1976. So it was very much like they saw it as this artistic community. There was a lot of writers there. A lot of artists historically had been there. So essentially moved to the beach, like in this amazing, beautiful spot, which was an amazing place to grow up. But a kind of also rude awakening in terms of just like education and kind of American culture. Like we felt like we didn't know anything about it. And so first day of school, when everyone stood up to do the Pledge of Allegiance, I was like, clueless. What are these people doing? This is cultish. Like, what are they talking about? You know what I mean? It was just very, very like confusing and it was never explained. And it was just like, the whole thing was so confusing to me. Yeah. (laughs) And then, like I said, I, I was like in the whatever it was, like the yellow workbook for math, which was like the lowest. And I was like a horrible speller, which I, to this day, am like, I came in at third grade. So I missed those kind of foundational, like first and second grades where you learn all that stuff. So I just kind of dove in and and did my best, but I was not a great student probably till like sixth grade because I was just sort of catching up. You know, that's interesting. I don't think we give a lot of thought to it, but the way that you're taught it's been sort of codified, right? So if you have to transplant yourself from one manner of teaching into another one where everyone who's your classmates kind of like they got the brief, they got the memo, they're doing it the way it's done here. Right. And you have to assimilate now because you are essentially, you're trying to assimilate to an inside language that nobody's realizing they need to go back and explain to you. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good way to put it. (laughs) I actually, I remember too, it was because it was 1976, it was the bicentennial. Mm -hmm. And the first kind of big school activity was like, you know, to dress up as pilgrims and go and East Hampton has like an old windmill. So like, there was like a maypole and then And I remember my mom sewing us, like, finding it hilariously fun to, like, sew all these, like, colonial outfits with bonnets. And we were just like, what is this? I don't understand. Why are we dancing around this pole? Why am I wearing an apron? I don't get it. It was so, so confusing. That was, like, my first year here. And I was just like, I don't understand. That is so funny. (laughs) It's so funny to look at, you know, the cultures and customs that you were raised in from an outsider's perspective and just see how absurd they are. And like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) so funny. So feeling like an outsider, but also in your homeland, I mean, did you feel a certain familiarity as well? And did those two eventually find some reconciliation with each other? I think so. I mean, I feel like there was obviously an awkward period of time. Like, I don't remember how long, but the place itself was so amazing. And I made great friends right away. And I think just being around the ocean, for example, was such a huge influence on just kind of like centering you and being in this place where, you know, people joke that like in the summer you would the last day of school, you take your shoes off and you put them back on the first day of school. (laughs) So it was like really like living in this really natural place and just finding connection with that. That does sound idyllic. So you said around sixth grade, you started becoming a good student. What about around ninth, 10th and 11th grade when puberty hits and you're really sort of forging your identity and you're you know, stating your values through the things, the way that you express yourself. What did that look like? I think I had this t- one teacher in sixth grade who was sort of known in the in the education system there. Her name was Pinky. Nice. Her name was Violet Webb, but everyone called her Pinky. And her particular way of teaching was really like what you hear a lot about now. Like we said poetry every Wednesday, you had to learn a poem. So I was like an expert in Shel Silverstein, of course. 
and you had to bring in a news item every Monday. So do you remember how the New York Times used to have those brief, like in brief, kind of the first page of the printed New York Times had like the overview of the news? Mm. And I would always be reading it in the car on the way to school. Just these things like that have just put me much more in touch with the world in a sense, like not like just we're learning everything in this classroom, but really thinking about the world in a broader sense. And we started language at that time. So there was just a lot more going on, I think. And ninth grade is when you moved into the high school there. So that was a really exciting, fun year. And I remember um, really great English classes and really great art and having a kind of great social experience at first, Mm -hmm. but then immediately coming up against the whole kind of high school (laughs) way that happens, you know, the kind of popular versus the artsy versus the whatevers. And like, I think I just did all of it. And so it was fine. But then I sort of started going more into a, an art place, which wasn't really cool, I guess. So I think a lot of those things split there. And I, I really wasn't happy at all at that school after that. Like my sophomore year was fine. My junior, senior year were just really not fun. <laughs> what kind of miserable? Was it like socially intellectually, creatively? I had a great group of friends, but it was very much like a small group that didn't fit in. It was kind of a combination. And I'm sure that when you look back at things, you kind of exaggerate them to a degree. But senior year, I it culminated kind of in my senior year being really unhappy. And my mom, as always, like recognizing these things before I do, said, well, maybe you could graduate in half a year if we, why don't we talk to the school or whatever? And so if also kind of my mom was always like in touch with my whole group of friends essentially. So like my one other really close friend and I both decided to not do our senior year. So we basically like took half a year. We had to double up on gym. That was the only thing we had to double up on in order to graduate. Oh, And I think we were so bad at gym too. Like when they did field hockey, they would let us play golf instead, for example. So okay. we like we were like never fitting in, you know what I mean? We were always like the ones who were like, just let them play golf around the track for gym because they can't do the field hockey <laughs> thing. <laughs> okay. So like your feet are happy and you have all these sandals and barefoot moments that feel really <laughs> good, but then school felt like this really uncomfortable, pinchy shoe that you just couldn't wait to get out of. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Yeah, because summers were always like so much fun and there'd be all these different people in flux into town during that time. So you would have all these different experiences. And then school felt more like heads down time. Do you feel like the structure of school was part of the problem? Like this sort of rote memorization? I think so. And I just wasn't great at that stuff, right? I liked the concept of math. I liked the concept of science, but I just wasn't great at sitting at a desk and just sitting there and doing whatever I had to do. I was definitely interested in the arts and I did a lot of work outside of that, but I didn't really recognize it as like what I was going to do in the future. It just was sort of part of what I was interested in. And in fact, I I was really interested in fashion and I was interested in um, photography and I was interested in all these things, which to me added up to a career in fashion design. Mm-hmm. Mostly because I I had no idea that graphic design was even a thing. I knew there was advertising because my room, my bedroom was like papered with like Calvin Klein ads and all of that. So I had like all of that kind of visual awareness, right? But I thought that advertising was kind of like men with cameras taking photos of Brooke Shields with her clothes half off, you know, (laughs) that was my vision of what advertising was. And so I was like, I want to make the clothes because I don't want to be in that world, right? Yeah. I just wasn't aware of the, the kind of breadth of what you could do. And I feel like that was, I've heard that story from other designers, like it just wasn't really an awareness that those careers were things you could do. Of course, I knew architecture, which also seemed to be all kind of older men doing some kind of large skyscrapers in my tunnel vision of what it was. And I knew like painting in the sense of like, 
de Kooning lived out there. And, you know, not that there were no women models, but it was like somehow felt very untouchable, a lot of those things. So to me, it was like, I want to make these clothes and I want to just figure out how to do that. So I hear that story from so many people. And it's also my same story. I had all these creative impulses in high school, but I had no idea where to place them and how to think of them as something that I could turn into a career. I also had my room littered with all of these posters and it was like an incredibly sort of creative interior space that I was really excited about. But same, it all added up to fashion design for me at first, at least until I found a different path. And okay, so Catch me up. If this is leading to what you think is fashion design, what did that mean? You graduated early. What did that mean for your college trajectory? So I graduated early, which meant just walking out mid-year. And then my mom, the deal was like that second half of the year was going to be making my portfolio and getting that work together. So I actually went back to Paris on my own and stayed with a friend of hers. And I did a ton of photography while I was there and took French, like at the Alliance Francaise, and then just trying to like re-engage with that part of my life. And then I came back and just was sewing a lot, making clothes. I, I was really into collage. So I did a bunch of almost like fashion ads, but out of collaging existing stuff. Mm -hmm. things like that. So most of my portfolio was that I took like a watercolor class, I think. And I, I remember going to like one of those portfolio day fairs at Pratt Mm -hmm. in 85, which was like Pratt in 85 was very much in a kind of dangerous quote unquote area. Like it was not very user friendly from a young girl out of town or point of view. Okay. But I remember going to that and they were like, we'll accept you right now. And uh, I applied to Pratt. I applied to Parsons. I applied to, I think what was called the museum school at the time in Boston. I applied to RISD and I got in all of them and I was waitlisted at RISD. I didn't really have a preference. I thought New York is best for fashion. So I was like, Parsons seems like the right fit and started school there And I remember going to like their assembly night where you learn about all the different things you could go into in your sophomore year and sitting through. And it was like, you know, there's illustration, there's painting, there's architecture, interior design, furniture, and what have you. And when they got to graphic design, I was like, that's what I do. That's what I do. I could do that. Like, it was like this eye opener, like, oh, actually collage is just like designing things with words. Like it was like this light went on in my head that suddenly I felt like that's really what I want to do. I don't want to do fashion. Also being in New York and sort of understanding better what the fashion design scene was, I was like, I'm not competitive enough. I'm not that ambitious that I want to do that. I just don't think that's me. Yeah, I had a similar experience. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people did. I mean, I feel like it's pretty normal to go off to school and figure out that your first choice wasn't really the right choice. So I think that's a story that we hear a bunch of times. With my story, I mean, it's not unlike yours. I went to New York City in 89 to study fashion at FIT. And because I came from Michigan, I think New York was very novel to me. So I really enjoyed being in the city. But I also found that I was not a fit for the fashion industry. Loved, loved, loved those two years in New York City. And they were foundational in many ways. And part of it was learning that, okay, fashion isn't where I belong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Going to go somewhere else. Yeah. So, and it was, again, my mom who was like, why don't you transfer to RISD? Because you got in, like I did get in on the wait list eventually. And she was like, "You maybe you need to be somewhere outside of the city. And I reapplied. They accepted me. I did end up going to RISD for summer session. That was like a complete transformation of just everything in my life. You know, I had the most amazing time. I made lifelong friends who I'm still really close with. It was like so much fun. (laughs) And it was really like that cliche moment of finding your people and, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and my people not being any 
particular type of people, like a really wide diverse of people who are completely different from each other and from completely different backgrounds, but yet kind of all had this quirky way of looking at life and like a a really funny sense of humor and like a nostalgia for like Stephen Eady or like all these really (laughs) weird kind of things that, that tied us together. Like I remember the movie Brazil came out that summer. Oh yeah. And I remember going to that with this huge group of friends and it was such a like example of what we all felt and believed in kind of, you know, (laughs) with like really weird point of view, like really kind of nostalgia for some period of time, but also like a really new way of thinking about things. It just sort of like a lot of the experiences I had that summer really solidified like at least the next 10 years of my life, I feel like we're affected by that. What a great choice. Again, thank you, mom, for for recognizing. (laughs) And at the same time, it can be such a relief when you realize you're in a place where you really can grow, where it feels really fertile for you, where it feels like you don't have to struggle against people misunderstanding or misinterpreting you, and where you also feel like you can explore everything and it's not going to be an issue and it sounds amazing and I'm glad you had that experience and you lucked into it I wish we could all go back to that place I'd like to be there now yeah I think also like that period of time the kind of like late 80s early 90s was also like this really fertile time for I would say design as a whole kind of like before it was called design in a weird way like right but we were all making things of course it was called design but I'm saying like design in the bigger sense that I feel like people use it now where you recognize everything is designed right well still working on getting people (laughs) to understand that but yes we do but I remember that time I was still in high school but MTV was a big thing and my dad's like, why do you watch this MTV all day? And I was like, well, it's kind of interesting. There's a lot of like creativity in the cinematography and the direction of videos, but the graphics are great. And my dad's like, what are graphics? Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't even yeah. really know how to explain it to him. I'm like, it's that logo that explodes and that man with the flag, <laughs> like that's graphics. Yeah. Or what they're wearing or like, yeah, like everything about that. And funny enough, I, my parents were of course, anti-TV. Mm -hmm. So we always had no cable and we always had like black and white TV when everybody else had, (laughs) you know, whatever. But I remember going to my boyfriend's house at the time and watching MTV all night over there. And so, and my husband now, David, we were just driving in the car yesterday and I, for some reason, put Annie Lennox on. Uh And he was like, oh my God, I, when I hear this, it's just like immediate visual connection to that video. And there's so many songs from that period, which I'm sure you've noticed, like, every playlist right now that you hear everywhere is all 80s. Mm -hmm. And it's like this weird, like visual, whenever you walk in anywhere, you're like, oh, that Madonna video, that whatever. (laughs) It's like, it's so visual for me, that period of time. Yes. So it's interesting that you say that because I do think MTV, like it's graphic identity, right? One of the most iconic and one of the first to be like, always changing and malleable, right? Mm -hmm, Which mm -hmm. became like, I think a huge part of at least how we think about brand. Yeah, that would, that would make sense. Yeah. And then if you think of any video you've seen on there and the fashion of it, the makeup, the androgyny, the, the storytelling, the narrative construction. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So much of it. It's, it seems like, oh, it was a moment in time, but like, I feel like a lot of those things really built a foundation of like visual awareness or something around all these different things. I think you're absolutely right. I was thinking about two by four, the the creative agency that you are a co-founder of and how the work that you do is so adept at translating a brand ethos into all of these material aspects that aren't necessarily medium specific. And in a way that's what those music videos were, it was like, how do we communicate the essence of this band in a short like commercial that has a soundtrack? (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. 
when you think back, you know, and obviously that continues today in so many forms and, and films have always done that as well. But I think there's something to that period that felt really fertile in that way and also kind of irreverent and like not conforming, like in the way that you might think film, even though there were always independent films and like I mentioned Brazil or something. Mm -hmm that felt more formal and more codified and like perfect and MTV felt imperfect and in progress and messy. And, you know, one would be really slick. The next would be like cut and paste, like stop motion. And the next would be whatever. And it just felt like this visual overload of inspiration. Yeah. Okay. So you're at RISD, you found your people. You also discovered that graphic design is your jam. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like that was a really fertile and thriving place for you. And you said it kind of set the course for your next 10 years. So I'm assuming the whole college experience was pretty satisfying in that regard. It was great. It's funny too, because I feel like graphic design was my major, but really the experience at RISD was more about developing a kind of way of thinking or a way of approaching any problem, right? Even though I was in graphic design, I was a little bit like irreverent about it. I was really like, my influences were like Laurie Anderson or Barbara Kruger, like yeah. Richard Prince, you know, things that were not traditional design in the sense of like, they weren't a, a brochure or a book even, although I was really into artist books, but they were kind of more artistic versions of graphic expression in a way. And that, that's sort of what I was interested in. But also, um, you know, there was a big push for kind of semiotics at the time and like really mm -hmm. fully understanding what graphic design messaging and visuals, what they can say visually, but also kind of inherently and in all of the different ways that you can understand information and expression through any number of things in design. Right. So I feel like I was much more open in a sense of what I was studying. I didn't envision myself as like traditional graphic designer in a way. And that's one of the wonderful things I think about, particularly RISD as an institution. I remember studying furniture design as a grad student there. And it's still the same. The students who are in a particular major don't necessarily feel compelled to make work that is associated with that discipline. And it's fully supported. I remember telling my teacher, he's like, we're going to do a chair project. So I want you to bring in several chairs that you're, inspire you. And I was like, I'm not inspired by chairs. I'm going to bring in the work of these California assemblage artists and like these other influences that I want my chairs to reflect. And they were like, okay, <laughs> do what you need to do. Yeah. <laughs> we'll support you. So from graduation, which was 89, and also, okay, you met friends, lifelong friends. I also met David there, who's my husband. So I met him my senior year. Nice. <laughs> yes, definitely yeah. long-term relationships. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> From graduation to the founding of 2 by 4 you're very, very early, like first steps into the professional world. What are the nuggets there that are really important for us to understand that got you into position of founding your own studio? I mean, I moved to the city with one of my now partners, um, Susan Sellers and I. We, we shared a loft on Canal Street, which was very... Interesting, fun, like <laughs> yeah. very rough, but, but exactly what we wanted, you know, and we both got jobs, um, for kind of small design studios. I worked with Bethany Johns, who was running her own practice at that time. And again, like I had this great kind of networky way of getting that job where I was kind of cruising the artist bookstores around town and just writing down who had designed books. And just started cold calling those people. Ooh, proactive, gutsy. And I also, um, I had worked at Bomb Magazine as an intern. So I was also looking at magazines and I went uh, and interviewed at Art Forum. Okay. And the art director at the time was Jean Foose. And she actually said, you know, my friend Bethany is looking for someone and I think you'd be a perfect fit. She also went to RISD. I feel like you guys would really get along. And I was like, that's so funny because I am meeting her tomorrow. And she's like, I'm going to call her. So when I went to meet Bethany, there was just this immediate simpatico between us. And we had a lot of the same kind of 
things that we had looked to when we were studying. And she was a poet and had become a graphic designer as a grad student. And she was, of course, working with like everyone who I had looked up to. Like she was in progress of doing a book with Richard Prince at the time. Whoa. She was doing a lot of work with Thelma Golden, who was at the Whitney Philip Morris and working with the Whitney Museum and doing all, like basically working with all the artists that I kind of looked up to. So I started working with her. And I think my first project was to design a book cover for the catalog for Image World, which was this great show that opened um, in the 90s at the Whitney that had Barbara Kruger and like every artist that makes visual work that feels graphic. So it was all about this idea of repurposing um, art and visual culture into art. And so it was like everything, like all of my worlds kind of colliding in, in the right way. That feels exciting. <laughs> and she was just a great mentor. She, again, like I said, she worked alone. And I don't think I mentioned, but when I was at RISD, I think computers did not exist until my senior year where they created like a computer lab where we all went and looked at them and said, like, those are cool looking. Like, what should we do with that? And we would often like type some things and print it out and then like wax it and put it on board. Like we were, it was just clueless. Like there was no sense of what was coming. And so actually Bethany and I, I worked for her for six years and it was very much like this sympathetic way of seeing. And we both learned how to design on in Quark, I think it was at the time, together and just sort of like built that practice up, mm -hmm. continued doing the same kind of work really for mostly museums and galleries. So a lot of books, a lot of catalogs, a lot of film titles, things like that, that were all kind of in the cultural world. So that was sort of my background and simultaneously in different worlds. Michael, my third partner, was teaching at Yale. Okay. After having taught at RISD, and he kind of um, developed that, the graduate program at Yale with Sheila de Bretville. And my partner, Susan, had traveled to Amsterdam and was working at some of the firms in Amsterdam doing graphic design and then came back. And Michael and Susan are actually also uh, life partners. So they lived in New Haven and started a practice there. Okay. And we're doing very similar work, but mostly for New Haven and Boston. And so at some point they decided to move into the city and they got this like sublet aloft from friends and it had like a big studio space in it set up. Oh, those were the days. Yeah. You can't get those anymore. No. <laughs> it was right on Bleecker Street and oh, man. 7th Ave. So it was like this perfect spot. In addition to working with Bethany, I had been doing a lot of freelance work. So a lot of book covers, a lot of album covers, CD covers, and trying like my hand at like, could I do this on my own? And so I decided to just take the time off and try just being a freelance designer for a while and see what it was like. And so that kind of coincided with them coming into town and we shared that space and they worked on their practice and I worked on my freelance practice in a shared space. And that's kind of the germ of where we started thinking about two by four. Ah, uh, yeah. If you put all the ingredients in the same oven, they're going to bake together. <laughs> yeah. And we started to, they were doing a lot of work with architects. Like mm -hmm. they were doing this magazine called Architecture New York. Okay. At the time that was one of their big projects. And it was really about the process behind architects and how they think about the work. And a lot of the architects at the time, like they did a lot of features on like Richard Gluckman, who was a big New York architect, also Rem Coolhouse. And so a lot of that work, as we started working together, because that project grew and then I started working with them on that, it was a very much an experimental graphic design project about the kind of experimental side of architecture. Okay. And so um, we tried to do it in this way where there wasn't a lot of authorship over anything. So we would have like several people in the studio working. We would work on one article and then you'd pass it on to someone else and they would work on it. And you kind of pass things around so that it didn't become like one vision per se. Mm. So it had like an underlying grid, but then all these different expressions within that. So it sort of like tested that 
boundary of graphic design in the formal sense that you have a grid you're working with, but then you have the ability to break it and kind of express on top of it. Yeah. And it still holds together. So that was kind of like this idea behind that magazine. I was always trying to flex as far as you could go experimentally, typographically, while staying within that one family. And it was kind of like, you know, that era of like ray gun and those things were kind of had just happened. So there was a lot of experimental typography happening. And my background was much more formal, like bookmaking for like artistic academic work. So okay, I did not come from that world at all. So it was fun to kind of just do something completely different. And we just kind of merged. And, and as we each built up our little independent practices, we would get projects which were kind of too big for one person or too big for two. So we'd be like, oh, do you want to do this together? And that just happened more and more to the point where we decided to join forces. To formalize in the form of two by four. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's been almost 30 years, right? Totally. Well, that's pretty great. I mean, 30 years in and of itself, is that's a long run. That's by any measure that's successful. And it also would imply that there has been a kind of evolution, right? I'm sure you haven't stayed static for 30 years. So I would love for you if you could paint a picture of maybe some of the highlights and challenges that you went through in terms of formulating your identity, retaining clients that turned into relationships, and maybe even some of the projects that really tested you or put you on the map. Yeah. And so that any project introduced us to a world of architects in New York. So that became like a really big part of what we started off doing, not only doing books and monographs for them, but also doing a lot of their kind of competition materials, which at the time in the architecture world, it would be like giant foam car boards with a model, right? And I think especially Rem Coolhouse really wanted to question that and was interested, especially in like what we have been doing, narrative approach to thinking about telling a story of a, of a project through writing, which he obviously had done a lot in his in his practice, right? And was interested in. And so we merged with him in a several projects where we would do a book for his competition. Okay. Where we would develop the narrative with him. And my partner, Michael, um, was already doing a lot of critical writing and had many columns in the design world at the time. So he kind of had that credibility and he and Rem became pretty great friends and worked really closely on a lot of the writing for those things. And then our studio would develop a lot of the graphic expression. So it would be both experimental in terms of like the narrative storytelling of a project. When I say experimental, meaning how architecture had been presented previously for those kind of things. And also because his work was so experimental, right? He was really rethinking material wise. Yeah. Everything really had a different kind of approach. And so a lot of that work was trying to bring that to life, like through diagram through narrative through photography of the models like but not like a beauty shot but like really digging in and trying to show all of his experimental materials that he was interested in so that was a super fertile body of work that was happening and then on the side of that we started getting work in more formal sense from brands like Noel came to us who really wanted to think about how to write about their brands, how to explain who they were as brands. And I think part of that was because Michael was doing a lot of writing in the design critic world, they could kind of see both our visual work, but also like that kind of strength of, of kind of brand strategy and thinking. Yeah. And so a lot of our work starts to take on a more of a brand strategy, free brand strategy terminology, right? It was really about defining a brand through words. How do you explain who they are? How do you explain their kind of values, their DNA, and do it in a narrative way that really kind of unfolds their story in some way and marries it with a graphic language? 
And at the time, we also, we got a lot of brand identity projects, which kind of came through that architecture filter again, like when an architect would get a big new project, often they would think of us because we had done a lot of work in that world. Mm -hmm. So we went through um, doing like the Brooklyn Museum back in 2002, I feel like it was, or maybe 2004. And we did just many, many museums throughout New York, the Studio Museum in Harlem, which was with Belma Golden. Wow. We've done projects in for the Picasso Museum in Malaga. We've done projects for LACMA. We went through a whole range of brand identity projects for museums, really through those relationships with Diller Scafidio, with Richard Gluckman, with Rem Kohlhaas, with these different architects that we had close relationships with from other times. And then they started really building things. And so a lot of our work became sympathetic to their work and kind of helped them. Okay. So that makes sense in terms of how an ecosystem is developing. But I also think that your particular mix of talents and background, like if they're going to bring you to a museum client, you have to in some way be able to relate to a cultural institution of that magnitude and what they're about and what their mission to be and to be able to speak that language. And I think that you, particularly with your interest in the arts and your sort of love of what they represent, were probably in a pretty good position to really embrace that work and and take it seriously, you know? And I think we were always interested in just the narrative behind things too. Like we wanted to write about the projects. We wanted to do really broad pinups where things were not unruly and not perfect. And so we, we really approached it from a messier place, I guess, like trying to really like unearth all the stuff and then share that early and then make sense of it. I mean, I feel like now you almost have to go in with a really polished idea or else they can't wrap their head around what it is you're trying to do. But that chaos from which you edit or distill. It makes all the difference. It does, I think. Because a lot of times there are just little sparks of ideas in there. And I think if you polish or get too far down the line, it's really your point of view. And our goal is never to have our point of view. In fact, we make a big point of saying like we're a collective. We don't have a graphic style. We say some people will mm-hmm. say, yes, you do. <laughs> but I don't think we do. But we're really taking a brand and trying to unearth what the essence of it is and then create work that feels really built of that brand. Yeah. And it starts with word choices, narrative construction, and visuals in terms of graphics. But at some point, you sort of branch into experiences and materiality and a lot of the sort of psychological implications that color has and symbols have and expression and space. Yeah. 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 How does it grow into that two by four? How does that grow into those types of projects? Well, I think like, again, we started with projects where we were given the graphic role in a building. So like we did that IIT project with REM studio very early on. That was a space that was entirely about material. It was essentially like a kind of, almost like a Home Depot. But the materials made all the difference in terms of communicating different ideas. Okay. And our job was we could touch any surface in the building and create a kind of branded space, like not a logo, but a space that felt cohesive through a whole series of expressive behaviors in the space. Wow. And so we designed for that particular building, a set of icons that we thought it was a student center. So we had this idea that you could create a whole set of kind of student activities from the most basic things to the most absurd, because that's what a student center is, right? You bowl there or you whatever eat or you cheat or you kiss in the corner with someone or whatever. (laughs) And so the idea that you could create this kind of very formal iconography, but have it be really wide ranging and then let those icons be either a tiny little pixel in a bigger image or giant 
to express like a kind of wayfinding strategy or create a space. So there are rooms where they're just like huge studying symbols and that's kind of a library space. There are rooms with giant photographs. And when you go close up, you see that each pixel in the face is made up of a little icon. And so there's like this world that happened. And I think that was our first project where we would point back to it later and say like, that was our first kind of experience design, if you will. Okay. Where we really like embodied a physical space with a brand idea and narrative. And that we've just taken that idea and done it a million ways now. Like we do that with all kinds of brands. We just did the headquarters for YouTube. So like really thinking about what that physical space should feel like. What are those kind of expressions that you want? And we do that for fashion shows. We just did a few years back, a big show for Prada's Women's Spring Summer, where we designed a whole set of wallpapers and kind of experiential graphics that were based in this curation of all women comic book artists. So we took like an edited down set of maybe five graphic artists, some of whom are still practicing, some whose estates we were working with, and took a lot of their work and then recollaged it to create these kind of narratives and then wrapped a whole fashion space with that. And as often happens with fashion, they're making the clothes up to the last minute. And so they often then take the work that we're doing and insert it into the collection. So like Runway Show had the walls covered in this content, but also the models were wearing, this, you know, the same patterns. And so it was like this super immersive, cool experience. Yeah. And then, you know, our social media campaign was like all in comic book form and So the work that we do sort of touches on all aspects of how the brand expresses itself, but really kind of all tying back to this one idea, whatever that idea may be for that particular project. As a creative, what do you find the most satisfying about that? Is it a sort of being able to influence all expressions of an idea? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's super... We way, way back when we were in that studio on Bleecker Street, we were even toying with the idea of maybe my husband, David, being involved because he was more of an industrial designer at the time Mm -hmm. doing furniture and lighting. We were like, we want to do it all. Yeah. And how can we do that? And we, you know, look to like Eames, for example, as a collective that did, you know, everything from film to graphic design, to furniture design, to industrial design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so that was always like our, in the back of our head, like we want to be like in studio, we want to be sort of media agnostic and just think about whatever the problem is. And I think a lot of times when clients come to us, they might have a specific idea of what they want and we might come back and say, but it should be a film or what if it were a space or a series of spaces or what if it were a narrative that you un cover through a series of things. So we're always trying to kind of reinvent the brief, not in a bad way, right? but in a good way, like really opening it up and thinking about what it could be. And I think we always had the attitude that if we didn't know how to do it, we would just do it and hire experts to help us execute, right? So we didn't worry about like, but we're not filmmakers, so we can't do a film. We'd just be like, let's collaborate with the filmmaker and make a film or let's, you know, we often would partner with small architecture studios when we started out, when we started kind of bridging that world and we didn't have the in-house capabilities. We would work with kind of two, three person architecture studios to help us with the 3D part of it. But we eventually built that all up. So now we have all those capabilities in house now. Which I want to talk about, but I also, for my personal satisfaction, I need to know about the the growing pains part where if you're reinventing the brief for the client, did you get pushback where they're like, yeah, but we don't know how to market a film or we don't know how a film is actually going to sell more product. And then also, how do you budget a project for a capability that you don't yet have, you know, you're going to be hiring out for? That would be the growing pain part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So I'm guessing there were some losses and gains. Uh, Okay. 
In terms of the first question, we really work on projects with clients who value design. So that's pretty broad, right? But I think it does touch on, we're not going to just design a logo from scratch if that's what you want. Like we're going to go through a brand strategy process and have an idea behind that logo. And then we're going to suggest some other things you can do also, because that's how we work. Okay. And I think we will always, of course, pitch that when we're introducing ourselves to a client and show them that. And we're working with their budget, so we're never going to do something that they can't afford or aren't willing to do. We might suggest it and they might be interested and add it, or they might not be interested or save it for later or whatever the case. But there's a very formal process on how that that work gets done. We're not kind of going rogue on anyone. (laughs) That makes sense. It also makes sense that the way that two by four grew, you would be attracting a client to you who's kind of wants you to reinvent the brief, kind of wants what you do. And setting those expectations in the upfront means everybody kind of knows they're on a ride and they're going to see where it goes, which is great. I think it's a different scenario if you're just hustling for work. For sure. Okay. So now over 30 years, all of those people you used to outsource to are now in-house. You have a team of 50 people or so? Yeah. Architects, designers, a digital team. Can you give me a snapshot or the aerial view of the two by four as a as a creative studio in practice today? Sure. So there's three partners, as I said, and we have a managing director who's really been key in terms of that budget piece, <laughs> like really keeping us on track and like being realistic about how we budget things, which made all the difference. And then we have a CFO and an admin team, but we also have a pretty robust project management team, which was an addition we made maybe 10 years ago, pretty late in the game that really helps us manage all the production of everything and some of the client facing scheduling and work, which really allows the designers to be free from that. And then on the creative side, we have a strategy team who really does a lot of the initial phase of a project. So kind of like really deep dive into the client, into the world that they're coming from. So let's say it's a fashion client, like into other like-minded brands and other brands that may be behaving like them, but aren't in their world, narrative trends, film, music, you know, anything that could be relevant also could lead into little deep dives into subject matter For one brand, we did a little deep dive into coolness, like what is cool, for example. And we love doing that kind of stuff, like creating like... Oh, that's probably where you learned about me, right? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You were in there. (laughs) So like these little mini briefs, which can be purely internal or could be shared depending on any number of things. Okay. So that team is made up of a lot of different types of disciplines. Like some people are retrained as strategists, some people are literature majors or art history majors or whatever. And they come and kind of learn the way that we do it. And so there's a lot of research and kind of back end work. But then the big part of the work is really formulating that into kind of an idea, a kernel of an idea, and then a whole expression that's verbal. And that might include narrative. It could be tone of voice or it could be copywriting or not. And then there's a brand team that works very closely with that team. A lot of times there's overlap between phases of work. So our strategy is quite visual. Like it's not like a deck that's just words. It's very much brought to life through design. So our brand team, if it's a branding project or our environments team, if it's an environment project, would work with them on on that kind of strategy phase. And then we have... Um, brand, which is mostly graphic designers, but there are some people who are motion, some people who are more like typographers, some people who are more rigid in their work. Some are super expressive. It's like a very wide range of people because our our projects kind of require all aspects of design. So it's not like one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So some people might be really great at like large expressive stuff, but not great at like a design system. Some people might be great at a design system, but not at whatever. So we really um, 
work super collaboratively and each project we create bespoke teams depending on the needs. Mm. And that team has, you know, everything from creative director level to junior designer level. And that's probably our biggest team because that's kind of our background, you know? And then we have what we call space, which is an internal term, but that's made up of our architecture team and our environments team. Okay. Architecture is um, all kind of trained architects. And then a lot of that work that they're doing is thinking more holistically about an overarching spatial experience, as well as like ground up building capabilities at building scale or at exhibition scale. So it's really, it could be take any form. And then we have um, our environments team is signage and wayfinding is kind of very specific thing that they can do, but that we do in a very broad way. So a lot of it might be creating like a kind of holistic visual experience within a lobby or which might include digital or might be all graphic or might be like as quote unquote simple as like a large scale wallpaper in a space or as complex as a large scale digital interface like we just did for David Geffen Hall at Lincoln Center where like the very large digital screens there have different states. So there's the kind of programmatic state where you get information and then there's a more kind of um, dormant state where it's much more this graphic pattern that almost feels like the wall is moving. A lot of those projects overlap and that team space is big because it's made up of those two disciplines. Mm -hmm. And then on the environments, we also have a technical team who are all about code and all the kinds of rules that you need to follow when you do signage and wayfinding, which is quite extensive. Yes. And then we have a digital team. Oh my gosh. It sounds like you've built a kind of ideal empire where you get to go work with fascinating people and learn with each project from all the different disciplines that are under you know, your roof. It sounds like you tell me if this is right or not. It sounds like you keep it flexible and collaborative, which is culturally, that's a real win. Oh, it's super fun too. Yeah. It keeps it. I think the most successful thing we've done in our practice is to keep it absolutely flexible. And so it's really changed over time. And we've never limited ourselves by the type of project we need to take or are we specialized in X, Y, or Z. And we've always just sort of like gravitated to the next thing. And it's changed so much over time from even when we were doing mostly graphic design projects, I felt like they were not too rigidly graphic design. They spilled out the edges. But now really most of our work is expressed across all media. Yeah. It's rare that we get a very formal brand identity where we're only doing like strategy and logo and collateral or something. Well, I mean, I just want to salute you from a position where I'd never felt comfortable with the caste system or with like categories and classifications that everybody sort of needs to impose on you in order to understand what you do. And then I just feel like the way that two by four has kind of blown out the expectations for what a design studio can do and how these specialities don't need to be what defines you. It's the creative process that can define you and the output as you can be medium agnostic that does a service for the whole design field. So <laughs> thank you very much for that yeah. as pioneers of, of opening up that space for the rest of us. Hallelujah. And also being successful at it is also key. I love to see as you as a thriving creative who's been doing this for 30 years, it sounds to me like you're still very satisfied with this, like work is still meaningful and exciting to you. And I mean, that's a creative role model right there. And I, I appreciate that. So I think you said it when you said flexibility was one of the keys to your success. It's also got to be about culture and long-term relationships. For sure. And so can you tell me, like, what do you think is the special sauce or the magic between the three founding partners and how you've been able to cultivate such a thriving culture 
that stays collaborative and flexible, which is a feat in and of itself. And also long-term clients relationships where they trust you and allow you to sort of speak in shorthand and come to them with unpolished ideas that you can then work on together, which is such a luxury. It's interesting. It's because I think that First of all, we, we really believe that if you're going to do a successful project, we need to be engaged with the end client. So if we can't work directly with whomever the project is really being decided on, it doesn't really make sense to do it because the dialogue that happens in the room of those meetings is everything, right? If you're presenting to a team that then is going to go present to a team that then is going to present to the CFO or whatever, Mm -hmm. so much is lost in translation and it is usually not successful. So we really believe in that opening up that communication channel so that we're really directly involved. And I think a lot of our long-term relationships is because of that connection that we make with that CMO, CFO, Mm. (laughs) whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we all have very different approaches to the work, funny enough. Um, and I think that's what's, cause a lot of people say, like, how can you guys still be together after 30 years? Like, don't you drive each other crazy? Like, of course we probably do. Like, I'm sure we all drive each other crazy to an extent, but we really have our own kind of special areas of expertise. I couldn't even tell you what they are, honestly, <laughs> but it's sort of like a, a sympathetic side by side skill where we're not really overlapping that much. So even though we have like, I could do a digital project, I could do a spatial project, I could do a brand project. And as can all my partners, we don't really like step on each other's toes in projects. So, and we collaborate on them as well. Like two of us can work on a project together and it's fine. So there's something about that, like having a kind of our own unique qualities that we bring to a project that aren't the same, that have allowed us to be great partners for many years. So that's one thing. What would you say is one of your unique qualities? I'm a great kind of editor and I bring people together and I'm really about kind of taking an idea, I think very visually a lot in terms of space and digital. And I think that I have that ability to really create a great team and pull it off like through a whole series of like art directorial roles and collaborative efforts and things like that. I don't even feel like a graphic designer anymore, quote unquote. Like I rarely sit down and design something myself. If I do, it's for a friend or for something personal, but really it's kind of knowing who the right person is for the right task, what their skill is and bringing the right teams together. And then the kind of bird's eye view of everything and sort of figuring out where we're not going right or where we are and kind of directing it. Mm -hmm. And that for me has been super satisfying because I think if I had been left to just be a designer on my own, I wouldn't have been able to do half the things that I've done, right? Like I'm not a great writer. I'm not a great graphic designer. I'm not like, but I am good at a lot of things and all those things also are, it's kind of a vision thing, right? Yeah. You can see the end and then make it happen. And I think, you know, both Michael and Susan are much more academic than me. They both have taught for many, many years. So they're very much in that world. And so they bring a lot more of like history of design and that kind of um, quality that I don't really have. Like I'm much more the popular culture one in the room. (laughs) (laughs) Whereas like Michael could bring up any number of things from graphic design history where I'd be like, but have you heard about this? You know? So I'm, I'm seeing you as like a band and you're all playing different instruments, but you've learned (laughs) to play together and create, you know, new melodies with each project and, you know, when to sort of step back and harmonize. Yeah. Our teams are really, really good. It's another interesting thing that we really do have long-term employees. Like people have been there for 10 years. It's unusual. And I think it's because we give a lot of room for people to grow and take on roles and we really trust them. And we don't second guess a lot of the work. Like it's not heavy handed directing. It's really more nudging. And I think people feel a lot of freedom and ownership over their projects. 
So I think one of the things that people may struggle with is that because we are really very much a collective, like we'll credit any project we do, we just credit two by four. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think a lot of younger designers really crave that, like having your name on something or really feeling ownership over something. And a lot of times you're working on projects where you did one part of a big thing and it's hard to point to it and say, look, mom, right? I designed this album cover or whatever, you know? So I think that that could be a struggle for some of the designers inside the teams. But I think ultimately you get to work on really big projects that you might not get to work on otherwise. And you're one of many people in an amazing expression of something. You yeah. Know? Well, I'd like to come work there for 10 years. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> Can we take a step out into maybe the broader aerial view of Georgie Stout, like your personal expression, you as a whole being are not just a leader in this creative studio and a designer. You're also a mother and a pretty fully actualized human who... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think that's good. <laughs> yeah. Has figured out how to live your life. I'm a dog owner. <laughs> dog owner. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> And I know David is a lovely human, so I'm yeah. imagining that like dinner at your house is a pretty great place to be. <laughs> so I guess my question is, in the creation of your life, have you ever struggled in how to allocate your energy, like your creative, emotional, and intellectual labor? Or have you always kind of found a natural equilibrium? Hmm. It sort of goes through waves, right? Because I think when we started the studio, it really required like all in, like we were working all the time till nine every night till, you know, weekends to make it happen. Uh huh. And that was a good 10 years of my life. And I look back and think like, why did we do that? Like now, when you think of the way we work now, and I feel the same way about motherhood, like I have these two amazing children that I craved being more involved with, you know? And I was involved in, with them in many, many ways, but like, why couldn't I come home at 3 p.m. and pick them up from school and, and then been engaged in them and then gone back online and worked late at night? Like I could have probably. Now it's completely accepted and tons of people in our studio do that. But at the time, it just wasn't like a viable thing. It didn't seem possible. So I feel like while work has always been really amazing, really positive, and I, I will say with three partners, you really can, like, if you need to take a month off or you need to do something, it's not a problem. Like, we're fine. We're all covering each other all the time. And so that's a great asset. But you still feel compelled to, like, really keep it going. And you have to really be there and be involved for the people in the studio to feel like ownership and invested in the work and the studio. So I feel like the studio itself has been a huge part of my life, like, like it or not, and still is, you know? Yeah. And there are times where I have been like, you know, I need to back out a little bit and spend time like with my kids, like my kids have gone through things where I really needed to be present and had to just be like, sorry, I'm not going to show up for a week because it's crisis is going on and I need to be there and I'm not going to worry about it. And that my family has always come first in those cases, right? Because that's the important thing. But both my kids are great. <laughs> my oldest son actually is at RISD in film and video. Nice. And will be a senior this year. And my youngest is about to embark at Maine College of Art and Design in Portland. So we're super excited for them both. They're doing their own thing. They're both like super creative, of course, keeping the gene going. That's awesome. Congratulations. So, okay. So thank you for sharing that it hasn't always been an easy equilibrium. I guess I'm wondering if you'd be so generous as to divulge when things get intense, what characteristics come out in you? That's my producer self. Oh, yeah. Okay. So here's what we need to do. We need you to go there and we need to... Blah, blah, blah. And yeah. so you... This, yeah. this, this. I've already booked your ticket. Go here. You're there. I've done that. 
Okay. It's really annoying, I think, to my family, actually, (laughs) because they're all like, oh, should I? And I'm like, I booked your ticket. You're going tomorrow. You're going to be there this time, whatever. Like, or I called the doctor. They said this, you know, and it's like, I haven't even had a second to process that thought and you've already solved it for me, you know? And I think that's not a good thing, (laughs) but it is the way that I behave a lot. And it's partially, it's my work thing, right? Because I'm always like, solving the next thing, making sure this is happening, whatever. And it can translate to all kinds of stuff. And so... Yeah. And I think as somebody who does these large scale projects, you're probably very attuned at looking down the road and seeing the sparks, the conditions that would create sparks that then would turn into a fire. And so course correcting before you get there is necessary. Yeah, I think that's right. (laughs) You know, I think in general, and I didn't talk about David at all, but he's, you know, also a creative and he does lighting and furniture. And I think where my partners, I think, are in the world of lectures, they teach. I have always not done that and chosen to like focus on family if I'm not focusing on work. Mm -hmm. But also I've actually collaborated a whole lot with David too and always been like, like a kind of vested interest in his success too. Like I think he's, you know, an amazing designer and I've always wanted to bring his work to life in a way that isn't just furniture and lighting, if you will. So, you know, we did worked on his showroom when he launched that and I've done his brand and I do a lot of his ongoing stuff, but that's also been like a kind of side job for me in a way. That makes sense, yeah. And so I've always been in that world of both in the kind of popular culture and and stuff, but also in the furniture and design world a lot. So I have sort of one toe in that industry as well. And that sounds like also some of the great synergies that are happening at the studio are also happening at home in terms of like being able to collaborate on life and art, Mm -hmm. bringing your strengths to complement the other person's not necessarily weakness, but maybe where they don't have a strength. And so you can sort of make something that's greater than the sum of its parts, which... Totally. There's nothing better than having a person like that in your life in terms of like having a home and wanting to build stuff. And like everything's always like, let's just build a table, you know, or whatever. It's like, it's so great. So, Yes. Well, I understand you also have a pretty majestic creative compound out on the Hudson River Valley, which you've been able to collaborate on together. Um, I'll look for my invitation. I'll send you my mailing address after this. (laughs) Anytime. (laughs) I want one. You you do have to stay in a little canvas house because our guest rooms are little canvas houses. Yeah, I'm down. Because the house itself is super tiny. But But it sounds like glamping. Yeah, it is. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, is there anything we didn't cover, Georgie? Is there any like sort of pressing existential concern that you feel like you want to unpack with us? I mean, not existential. I think a really fun bit of news is that David got the Rome Prize and is going to Rome for six months on September 1st. I didn't know. This is fantastic. Give him a hug and congratulations. That's amazing. And so I'm excited to go. I'm going to go for six weeks, which is not as much, but it will be a real just different world, you know, to kind of step away from my day to day. Both kids are going to be at college. Someone's going to come stay with my dog and I'm going to roam and just kind of chill. I'm going to work, but I'm going to work half time and kind of just be off, which I don't think I've literally ever done my entire career. I think the longest I had off was maternity leave. And then away from the studio would be during COVID. But I've really never had a moment to step away and just like be in the moment, be in some other place and feel disconnected in a good way. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to that in in October. So think of me there wandering I will. And I also will be really interested to hear an update in terms of how being able to unplug like that and sort of absorb a new set of stimuli, like how it might change your perspective. Yeah. 
very excited about that. Thank you for sharing that news. And thank you so much for, for sharing your whole life and your creative process. I mean, I think sure. it, I really meant it when I said thank you for opening up a pathway for other creatives to enjoy the possibility of creating a studio that can be without borders. Because I think that's sometimes where we can do our best work if we can only get others on board. So it's really important work that you've been doing. Thank you. <laughs> well, like I said, it's been a really fun journey. So, and it continues. It's like still ever evolving. So that's the good part. Yes, that is the good part. Well, thank you so much, Georgie. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for listening. For a transcript of this episode and more about Georgie, including images of her youth and her work and a bonus Q&A, head to cleverpodcast.com. If you like Clever, there are a number of ways you can support us. Share Clever with your friends, leave us a five-star rating, a kind review, support our sponsors, or hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app so that our new episodes turn up in your feed. We love to hear from you on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. I mean, X. You can find us at Clever Podcast and you can find me at Amy Devers. Please stay tuned for upcoming announcements and bonus content. You can subscribe to our newsletter at cleverpodcast.com to make sure you don't miss a thing. Clever is hosted and produced by me, Amy Devers, with editing by Mark Zurawinski, production assistance from Alana Nevins and Anushka Stefan, and music by L1011. Clever is a proud member of the Surround Podcast Network. Visit surroundpodcasts.com to discover more of the architecture and design industry's premier shows. Those are cool looking. Like, what should we do with that? <laughs>